is an adverse adverse transfusion reactions. Our chief speaker is Dr. Jermaine Makori. Dr. Jermaine Makori is a pathologist at the Kenyatta National Hospital, and she's currently the head of hematology lab and the blood transfusion units. She's also a member of the National Hemovigilance Technical Working Group. Dr. Makori, hope you're in. Yes, Dr. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, and I, I'm hoping it's a good time to start if it's not uh, too early for everyone. I think it's, it's two minutes past two. If it's agreeable yes. with everyone, we can, uh, Doctor, you can take it away. Can you help me share the presentation? Okay, Nelson, are you in? Let me do that right away. Nelson, if you're in, you can share the presentation for us as I send it, before I send it to my mail. Sure, sure, anyway, okay. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Dr. Makori. Today's uh, presentation is uh, part of a series that has been going on, uh, courtesy of the Kenya Tissue and Transplant Authority, and we are continuing with transfusion. So today we'll talk about the rational use of blood and blood products, touching on uh, transfusion practices and adverse reactions. Eh? So the scope of my presentation will be definition, blood groups, a bit on the blood and blood products, especially the ones available in our setup, transfusion reactions, and as we, I will look into the, some of the policies on blood transfusion that we need to be aware of. So by definition, a blood transfusion is the safe transfer of blood component. This is from a donor to a recipient. Eh? And this practice has been uh, done successfully since the 17th century. So it is not something uh, new. A bit has changed along the way because they had to overcome the complications that were arising. But um, one of the major issues that came about was the commercialization of the blood donation. And the WHO had to come in and establish clear guidelines in the, in the practice of blood transfusion. Huh? Next, okay. So the sources of blood and blood component, as you may understand, it is from a donor. And we get uh, blood from a donor different ways. We can either do apheresis. This is uh, by use of a machine. There is a special machine uh, where you can uh, either get the blood as it is or a selective removal of blood constituents from blood donors of, or patients. Eh? So in this case, you can, uh, Put a, put a donor on the machine and maybe collect red blood cells alone or collect the platelets alone or plasma or some other components of the blood. Eh? It can also be used not only for donation but also for treatment eh? when you need to exchange. Eh? Like uh, in some conditions, patients who have some, uh, some substances in the plasma that you need to remove, you can remove them. Then, eh? remove the plasma, filter it, and uh, put back now the part that has been filtered. Eh? The same when you have uh, patients who have uh, some blood diseases, even things like sickle cell, you can pass the blood through filtration where you collect now the fragment, fragmented red blood cells, then you take back now the no more red blood cells. Eh? But uh, what we use commonly is uh, blood donation. Eh? 
In blood donation, you have a donor, you collect blood. Then once you have collected the blood, so you can filter it or separate it into different components. These donors could be donating to a recipient, that is the, in the case of allogeneic, or to themselves. Think about somebody who is to undergo an elective surgical operation. They come like three weeks before the operation. They donate two un one unit of blood. They can come again a week before another unit of blood. Then when they go for surgery, the same blood is eh, taken back to them. Eh? That is autologous transfusion. Eh? Next slide. So as I said, we have autologous. That's when you're donating to yourself and also allogeneic. Eh? That is from a donor to a recipient. Eh? Can move to the next slide. So once blood has been taken, it has to pass through some uh, procedures. And one of them that is very key is uh, to check the blood group. Huh? And when we talk about blood grouping, these are uh, systems that are there to characterize different blood, uh, different blood cells. Huh? And we have over 29 blood group systems but the one we routinely use is the ABO and RESAS. Eh? So the ABO is the most important because it was the first one to be characterized and has been maintained since, though these other ones came in, but they came in after ABO. So it is the most commonly encountered in transfusion reactions. And uh, almost everybody lacking the corresponding antigen has an antibody to it. Eh? So it is easy to characterize who we react to what. Eh? So these antibodies and antigen are what we use now to characterize people. And we know that we, uh, we have uh, the anti, we form this antigen uh, when we are in utero and everybody who is born has some antigen, belongs to a certain blood group. Eh? Then uh, Within the first month of life, we get now to form the antibodies huh, to the blood group that we don't have. Huh? Now, as I said, this was the first one to be discovered huh, and has been uh, kept as such and everybody's using ABO and RESAS grouping. Huh? Since we're not doing for those are the small blood grouping, we, that it is the reason why we refer now to the cross matching huh, where now, we see whether there could be any other reaction between the donor and the recipient. Next. Next slide. Next slide, okay. So these antigens are found on the blood, the red blood cells, but also they can be found on other cells. Eh? Think about platelets mainly. And uh, there are two groups that we are using currently, the ABO and the RESA system. And uh, when I talk about the ABO, it is strongly antigenic. And uh, as I said, please move to the next slide. As I said, it is uh, also associated with naturally occurring antibodies. The group O is called so because it has no antigen, but it has both antibodies, anti-A and anti-B. While we have uh, another group that has no antibodies, that is the group AB, but they have both antigens, eh? as we will see below in the table. So this is what I'm talking about. As you can see in this chart, we have uh, the blood group O, that is now the universal donor. It has no antigen. Eh? But in the plasma of these people, we find circulating anti B and anti A. While blood group A has A antigen and B antibodies eh, to anti B. Blood group B has B antigen and anti A. So your blood group is determined by the type of antigen that your blood cells carry. When I talk about blood cells, I'm talking about the red blood cells. Now we look into the inheritance of these blood groups. These blood groups are inherited from both parents, where the antigen is uh, the dominant, 
Well, the, uh, the presence of antigen will be now the dominant uh, allele. You can see here, if you have a parent who carries AO, this parent will be A, blood group A, while BO will be blood group B. So you, from there now, now you can, you can see below the type of children they are likely to have. Huh? So they can have a child who is AO, will be characterized as blood group A. The child can carry both A and B antigen and BAB or BO or OO, that is now the blood group O. So from the ABO blood groups, we go to the Rezas D grouping. Eh? Next slide. Please, next slide. Okay, Rezas D grouping is strongly antigen antigenic and it is present in 85% of the population. Eh? You, you know, when you talk about D+, plus, those are people who have the Rezas D antigen. Eh? And uh, when you talk about 85% of the population, it means that 85% of the population has Reza, are Rezas positive. Eh? So the antibody to Rezas D, the anti-D, does not occur naturally. It is, this is where now it differs from the ABO grouping. Eh? But those people who don't have the antigen, they can form now the antibodies to it. Eh? Meaning people who are as D negative can form anti-D. And um, this is what you said here below, the 15% without the D antigen may form antibodies upon stimulation eh, by Rezas D positive. Eh? This is mainly red blood cells or after delivery of Rezas D positive baby, but we know that they can, it can also be stimulated through other exposure, let's say organ transplantation and such. And this will lead to a hemolytic disease of the newborn in pregnant women who are raised as negative from part, and are pregnant from partners who are raised as D positive in cases when they carry a raised as D positive fetus. So these women during delivery or uh, during abortion, they can get exposed and their body now will form anti resus the antibodies, eh? and that will now affect the subsequent pregnancies, leading to hemolytic disease of the newborn. Eh? The inheritance of resus D grouping is more or less similar to that one of ABO grouping. Please, next slide. Where we inherit the gene from both our fathers and mother, as you can see here, um, let's say a mother is, uh, has rhesus negative and the father is rhesus positive. Well, we have a big D and small D, those are considered rhesus D positive. Huh? But now, when you, the father has, has both, uh, has the, the dominant gene, the capital D and small D, you may end with a mother who is rhesus negative, you may have a mixture of children eh, going up to 50%. Eh? So the inheritance in the nutshell is from uh, both parents, the father and the mother. So we go to the next slide. You can go to the next slide. I think I've talked about this. So blood and blood components Doc, please go to the next slide. Next slide, please. This Such is about to... moving for us. Yes, okay. Now, so blood and blood component, the donated blood can be transfused as it is. Eh? This is when we talk about world blood, but we are moving away from that because of associated risks. Eh? and increase in uh, transfusion reactions. Eh? So currently what we are doing, the blood is separated and this separation can be either by physical means such as centrifugation, where you get various blood components, this uh, like uh, red blood cells, platelet, plasma, then plasma can be further separated into other, other products. Eh? 
like clotting factors or uh, other cells, though rarely do we use the white blood cells. Huh? Another mean of separation would be sedimentation. Huh? Where well, you would let blood stay, then uh, it sediments. Huh? You find the red blood cells at the bottom, then there would be a buffy coat between the red blood cells and the uh, plasma on top. Huh? And this buffy, cell, buffy coat now contains mainly platelets and uh, white blood cells. Huh? Please, next slide. So now, what is in our blood? This is what I was talking about. When you let blood sediment, you get uh, in a tube. If you put it in a vertical position, you get at the bottom red blood cells, then white blood cells, platelets in the middle. This is now the buffy coat and the plasma that will be on top. Huh? So you can see now we have all our blood cells. Huh? But uh, this is not all because we know from the plasma, there are several other components. Huh? that can be isolated and are still useful to the patients. Huh? So the component of blood would be, next slide, please. In the plasma, which is supposed to be 55% and a solid component 45%, remember your hematocrit, this is actually how it is measured. This is in a, in a, a healthy adult huh, person. Huh? You will, uh, get from the plasma mainly water, but also proteins, other nutrients, salt, metabolites, enzymes, and hormones. So all these are mixed within the plasma. So you can go further and separate the plasma and isolate all these components. Now in the, in the part of the red blood cells, remember the supernat the buffy coat that separates the red blood cells and the plasma, it is rich in white blood cells and platelets. Eh? But now below we get mainly the red blood cells. Eh? So as I said, the blood, the blood products from whole blood, you get the cellular component. These are the red blood cells, platelets and white blood cells. Then you get the, the, liquid, the liquid component from uh, the fresh plasma. This to give us now the fresh frozen plasma. I believe you have seen it being used in the hospital. Then a cryoprecipitate. This cryoprecipitate is rich in factor eight concentrate. This is the coagulation factor I'm talking about. Then if you let it thaw and you get a supernatant, that supernatant will get a, it will be rich in albumin, immunoglobulin, and also other coagulation factor concentrate. So when we are not, uh, when you don't need specifically factor eight, you can use the cryo supernatant huh? because it will give us the other factors that are found in the plasma. White blood cells of all these things is the one we don't usually use. Huh? We have moved away from this, though we still get requests of people asking for world blood, but let me take this opportunity to remind you that as much as in the world blood, you get all these things, by refrigeration, some elements become neutralized, like platelets are not viable after refrigeration, but also transfusing white blood cells is uh, associated with increase in transfusion reactions. Eh? Because you remember your white blood cells have the inflammatory cytokines and uh, other inflammatory uh, substances that get released eh? more so after storage when the cells start disintegrating and those granules are now are, are releasing the content. Eh? So we, when we used to use the whole blood for transfusion, we used to get a lot of febrile transfusion reactions. Eh? And this has reduced with use of uh, packed red blood cells. Eh? There is still indications for world blood, like an acute hemorrhage, patients who come with massive hemorrhage. But again, when we are doing this, we are overusing our products because one unit that could have saved the four or six patients goes now for one patient and may not even be enough. So we have other solutions that we can use to sustain now the blood volume if we need to maintain the blood pressure or such. We don't need to use the blood for that. 
So when we are selecting a blood donor, we consider the ABO and RESAS grouping. Yeah? As we know, please next slide. You want always have a corresponding blood group. Huh? So when you have a patient who is blood group A, you may not always have blood group A at hand to give to that patient. Huh? So there is another selection you can use. You can see the one that is uh, closer to that, like the one who has a uh, who does not have the antibody to that group or who is not likely to react, we know that blood group A and B react differently. And uh, from here, you can understand that we have a universal donor, that is blood group O, can donate to all of them. Huh? But when you are selecting, we may not always select blood group O as the first one. Huh? So if we have blood group A or B with, or even AB, we select first that same blood group huh? and raise us. Huh? Here, that is where the resus also, resus factor also is considered. Yeah? Where resus positive can receive both resus positive and negative, but resus negative can only receive from resus negative blood. Yeah? So we have a universal donor, we have as blood O and the universal recipient as blood group AB. But the first selection is always a corresponding blood group. So we go to the indications for red blood cell transfusion. Uh, the indications are so many, but uh, these are some of them. Talking about blood loss, there are different ways you can lose blood during childbirth, after an accident, hemorrhage, traumatic. Um, patients with bone marrow failure, when the bone marrow is not producing blood, red blood cells. Inherited disorders of cell lines, aplastic anemia, and such, acquired disorders of blood cells, neonatal exchange transfusion. The indications are so many. And um, here usually there is no, because this is straightforward. As far as red blood cells are concerned, we know the markers we follow, we follow the hemoglobin level, the red blood cell total count. Then we go to indices, and from there, you decide now to transfuse your patient. Huh? So we transfuse red blood cells because of the oxygen carrying capacity and also to replenish the red cell mass. Huh? Please move to the next slide. Um, we have always to remember that there is a risk of fluid overload, of circulatory overload, especially in neonates. Huh? Not only in neonates, but also in those patients who have conditions where they have hyperviscosity. I'm talking about patients who have very high blood cell count, eh? not necessarily the red blood cells. Eh? You can have a patient who has chronic myeloid leukemia when the white blood cells into, is into hundreds of thousands per microliter. And in that case, we have to be aware of fluid overload. Eh? because there is hyperviscosity already. So the more you transfuse, and they may present with anemia, but you should know that you have to monitor them when you're transfusing. Yeah? So in an adult, one unit to raise your hemoglobin level by one to two gram per deciliter. And this need not be ABO identical, but compatible, huh? as I show, I've shown you in the chart. And um, resus negative recipient receive only from resus negative donors eh, as far as red blood cells are concerned. Now we go to the platelet transfusion. Platelets are obtained from separated blood from a donor. And uh, they can also be autologous. This is when we're using an aphoretic machine where you can donate donor. Uh, they are given back to you. Selectively extracted through aphidesis, as I said, and uh, platelets are never refrigerated. Eh? So if you have a patient who has both anemia and uh, severe anemia and severe thrombocytopenia, and you need both component, please don't be ordering whole blood eh? because our blood is refrigerated immediately to the, or within hours of collection because as we wait for the results of uh, screening uh, for TTIs, uh, 
So by that, ref after that refrigeration, we know that our platelets are not functional. For you to get platelets, you have to collect blood from a donor, separate it, get your platelets, then continue refrigerate, go refrigerate the red blood cells as the platelets are kept at room temperatures, but on an agitator. So they have to be constantly agitated. And the shelf life is five to seven days, unlike red blood cells that can go up to 45 days. And one unit of platelets will rise the count by 10,000 cells per macroliter. So the, we get a lot, a lot of requests for platelet transfusion and uh, clinicians may not be happy with the questions that are being asked in the blood transfusion unit. And this next slide is the reason. Huh? Please, next slide. When you're transfusing red blood cells, it is clear the indication is there and it is confirmed by the hemoglobin level as one of the parameters we're using. But for platelet transfusion, we have quite a number of contraindications. So it is not that the platelet count is low that you have to go ahead and transfuse platelets. Actually, you may, you may worsen the situation, eh? like in cases of immune-mediated thrombocytopenia. But uh, common indications for platelet transfusion is decreased production, increased destruction or loss, and also platelet function defects. So um, decreased production, like in cases of leukemias, patients who are on chemotherapy, congenital disorders, aplastic anemia, severe liver disease, increased destruction when we have cases of disseminated intravascular coagulation, or also in cases of massive transfusion, then uh, platelet function defects in myeloproliferative disorders, patients who are on aspirin, uh, patients who are on uh, dialysis, all that. Eh? So how do we select platelets for transfusion? We prefer to use ABO matching. Eh? Usually it is recommended that you can use any for platelets, eh? but you know the process of separation, you may end up with a few red blood cells in your platelets, eh? and that is why we, prefer, we go to ABO matching, eh? where the first choice is ABO identical, where A gives to A, B to B, A, B to A, B, O to O. But the second cho choice would be plasma compatible, those who share similar antibodies, eh? because these platelets are lying into plasma. And uh, the third choice, again, plasma compatible, where A can give to AB. Razor smudging initial choice is razor smudged again eh? due to red blood cell contamination eh? to reduce now alloimmunization of the donor. These are now the contraindications to platelet transfusion. Eh? Uh, now, the, in, these are mainly immune mediated thrombocytopenia, different conditions. Eh? Like the commonest in our setup is ITP, immune thrombocytopenic purpura. And in this case, when the, the patient will present with very severe thrombocytopenia, most, most of the time it is below 20,000, the platelet count is below 20,000 per macroliter. And uh, they may present with epistaxis, with low HB, and uh, the first instinct that comes into the mind of the clinician is to give platelets. But you know, once you give those platelets, the body immune system of the recipient marks them and also now mounts an, 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 uh, an immune reaction towards those platelets and wipe them out. So if the platelet count was eight, you come back the next morning, now they are two, despite you even transfusing platelets. Then um, also in cases of DIC, um, there is another one in chronic aplastic anemia and myelodysplastic syndrome where patient present with thrombocytopenia, but these are conditions that are ongoing. Eh? And uh, if you keep on uh, transfusing platelets from different donors, patients get immunized, and some of these antibodies may, mm -hmm. uh, may now attack the patient's own uh, reduced platelets. Eh? And, uh, 
now you have made the patient be dependent to platelets. Eh? And whenever you'll be transfusing, the count will be even going lower. So you have to refer to the uh, definitive treatment for these conditions or give immunomodulators eh? like steroids eh? to reduce now the reaction eh? of the immune system towards the platelets. Then plasma coagulation defects that are unrelated to platelets. Eh? Because if you have a patient who has a hemophilia and is bleeding, you better give the factor that is deficient, you, especially if the platelet count is normal. You don't need to give platelets. Eh? We only supplement what is not there. So platelets are used for treatment, but also for prophylaxis. Eh? The platelet count, once it reaches below 20, you need to start uh, to give platelet transfusion, but this is with a caveat. This is in those patients that are at very high risk of bleeding. Eh? Think about uh, a woman who is maybe going into labor and her platelet count is low in, in late pregnancy, and she can go into labor anytime. Eh? In that case, you have to prepare for that. Eh? because you can't go into labor with a platelet count of 10, for example. Then um, when you have a platelet count below 50 and the patient is bleeding with concurrent coagulopathy or impending surgery or exchange transfusion, you're supposed to correct it and bring it to at least 100. Then uh, for some other surgeries like ophthalmic surgeries, any surgery on the eye or uh, neurosurgery, the platelet count should be above 100. Eh? So if and when they're going for surgery and they're not bleeding and they have a platelet count of 70, you need to transfuse that patient with platelets to bring them to above 100. Eh? Because once bleeding starts in those uh, structures, you cannot manage it, you cannot stop it. Eh? The other product we commonly use is fresh frozen plasma. Please, next slide. So fresh frozen plasma is uh, used for correction of microvascular bleeding. This one, now before we give it, we usually get evidence that it is needed. Eh? And one of the commonest is a coagulation profile, PT and PTT. And uh, mostly for fresh frozen plasma, you go by the PT. Uh, we use it for bleeding due to multiple coagulation factor deficiencies and also massive transfusion with coagulation abnormalities, bleeding due to warfarin therapy. And uh, in, this, in this case, we should not use it if the patient is not bleeding eh? because there are other ways to reverse the warfarin therapy in cases of overdose or uh, let's say women who are on warfarin maybe for DVT and they get demences, they forget to stop the warfarin and they come with menorrhagia. In that case, you have other ways to reverse, think about vitamin K um, or other such treatment. Yeah? But if you don't have it at hand, you can use FFP. So FFP can be also contraindicated in some condition. We should not use it as a volume expander because, please, next, next slide. Okay, it should not be used as a volume expander like after hemorrhage, hemorrhage or such because we have other products that you can use and reserve this FFP for cases of factor deficiency. So if there is no evidence of factor deficiency, you should not use FFP. Then you should also not use it as a source of protein, eh? as a nutritional source of protein. If you are having patients who are malnourished and uh, they have uh, low albumin, you can give them albumin. There is a preparation a commercial albumin available, so you should not go to FFP. Then also it should not be as a used as a substitute of a readily available factor concentrate. Eh? So where you have commercial, factor, coagulation factors, we prefer to use those ones than leave FFPs for other conditions. Eh? Then um, when we are selecting, we also refer to the ABO compatibility for FFPs as well. Eh? 
The dosage will be determined by the clinical situation and the body size, eh? and we measure per kilo, usually 15 milliliters per kg for loading dose. Then you can go on with 10 milliliter per kg to maintain the hemostasis. Eh? Every day, it is usually over like two, three days. It can even be correct. You can even correct your hemostasis in one day. So after I've given your unit, you check for the symptoms to disappear, then you repeat your coagulation profile to know if you need to continue substituting. The other preparation we get from uh, plasma is cryoprecipitate. This is obtained from thawed FFP. So once it is frozen, we let it thaw up to, uh, between one to six degrees Celsius. Then you refreeze it within one hour. And then you, after collecting then, uh, that precip precipitate, and it is frozen at minus 18 degrees Celsius for one year. This is uh, the minus 18 degree. This is a commercial freezer. One unit has over 80 international units of factor eight. It has also von Willebrand factor and over 150 milligrams of fibrinogen. Eh? So it is a very good source of uh, factor eight, von Willebrand factor and fibrinogen. Eh? And um, it can also provide, it is a good source for factor 13 and fibronectin. Eh? The uses for cryo are fibrinogen supplementation in patient with DIC, patient with dysfibrinogenemia or hypofibrinogenemia, severe von Willebrand disease, uh, factor deficiency, that is factor 13, and also to reduce platelet defect in uremia. You remember that uremia gives you thrombastenia. So the platelets may be there, but they're not functioning eh, as expected. Eh? Hemophilia A, the use in hemophilia A, its use has been reduced, but even now where there are commercial factors, we know that they are not everywhere. Even in KNH, sometimes we don't have them and we refer to, we give our hemophilia cryoprecipitate, eh? that is hemophilia A. Then uh, it can also be used intra-op to provide topical hemostat. Eh? though I haven't seen it being used in our setup, but it is one of its uses. So that was about now the blood components. I can talk a bit, I will talk a bit about the transfusion reactions because it's something we get to forget, we tend to forget. Uh, and these transfusion reactions are divided, they are classified in different ways. They can, by the time they occur, they can be immediate or late occurring. They can be immune or non-immune mediated. You can have a hemolytic or non-hemolytic transfusion reaction. Then you can have infection related or non-infection related. So each one of these classification, you can get now example about it. The, some of the complications, sensitization, this is uh, like things like uh, alloimmunization, where you are donating, when you are receiving, uh, the patient is receiving uh, blood product from a donor, they can end up being uh, alloimmunized. Please, next slide. That uh, another co common complication. These are some of the commonest uh, problem associated with massive transfusion, because as you are giving several units of blood, that is anticoagulated, you may end up, you end up now also overloading the recipient with anticoagulant. So you may end up with a hemorrhage, you end up with a lot of antibodies in the plasma, then uh, electrolyte imbalance. Do you remember the blood cell, the red blood cells that have been staying around in the refrigerator? Some of them end up fragmented and uh, reducing the potassium. Uh, the intracellular potassium, and also the anticoagulant binds calcium. So you may end up with hypocalcemia. So you can imagine now hyperkalemia and hypocalcemia, how it is going to affect the heart, the kidney, and uh, the complications that can follow from that. Eh? Febrile reactions against leukocyte or platelet antigens. 
This used to be very common when we used to give whole blood, eh? but with the reduction of uh, transfusion of white blood cells, the febrile reactions have reduced quite a bit. Eh? But what we get more now are uh, febrile and hemolytic reactions due to transfusion of blood containing live microorganisms. Eh? Please, next slide. And the commonest in our setup is malaria. Malaria is still there. And uh, now with the change in the recommendations on the use of antimalarials, you know we are not using the current antimalarials for prophylaxis. So you have to have proven that the patient has malaria for you to give antimalaria. So for those who have received the transfusion, it is not uncommon when they start getting fever and uh, when you do a blood smear, you find that it is malaria. It is a reality in our setup, but there are, we know there are other infections that can be transmitted. Though these have been reduced with the screening that goes on, things like uh, uh, HIV, hepatitis, but there are others that are not screened, like uh, CMV, HPV. We have uh, bacterial contamination. The one that we test for is uh, Treponema pallidum, but you can also transfer others from the skin, Streptococcus, Staphylococcus. Uh, protozoa, as I said, plasmodium. There's also trypanosomiasis, uh, filariasis, leishmaniasis. Though I haven't seen any in our setup, but it is a possibility. Other reactions you can get, uticarial reaction. These are minor reactions and usually come two days after transfusion. Uh, fluid overload, I emphasize this on the unit specifically, and patients who have uh, other comorbidities, where it is not only anemia, but I have to consider the whole blood profile. Eh? That is the whole hemogram. Eh? You don't rush to do HB alone, even or even if the patient is pale, you should never do your HB alone. Eh? You should check also the white blood cell count and the platelet count, so the full hemogram. Eh? Um, Air embolism can happen resulting, resulting in sudden death, but this is taken care of by uh, knowledgeable uh, nursing staff or uh, clinical staff who fix these transfusions. Huh? So they know what to do to avoid uh, getting air into the vein. Huh? Other infection that may happen are minor like thrombophlebitis. This is the inflammation of the vein. Uh, vasoactive substances that can be transmitted, or uh, in patients who are receiving, who, will, who are likely to receive several transfusion, think about uh, sicklers who may be getting crisis very often with low hemoglobin level and you end up transfusing them, so okay, they can get transfusion hemosiderosis. Eh? This is iron overload. Eh? There is treatment for it though. Next slide, please. Next, we have gone through that. So this is the chart with the transfusion reactions. So some are acute, others are delayed. And uh, we, are, we are keen on, on checking on the acute reactions, but we forget about the delayed reactions. Huh? So the delayed reactions can be immunologic or non-immunologic. Huh? The non-immunologic are many the disease transfusion of infections, transmission of infection, the iron overload, but the immunologic, we tend to forget them. Huh? So if you get a patient maybe who has malaria and uh, they come with a hemoglobin level of four and you transfuse them, then you check the HB is 12, you discharge them, malaria has been treated. Don't assume that this hemoglobin is going to continue being 12 because depending on what else the patient had in the system, they can get a late hemolysis. Eh? So it is not unusual after two weeks, the HP goes down and you receive the same patient eh, with severe anemia. And you should always make sure that once a patient has been transfused and you discharge them, you call them back after two weeks and you check the hemoglobin, the hemoglobin level. That would be a pointer. And if possible, do a peripheral blood film. Huh? Before now, doing now the full, uh, uh, the full 
screen for hemolysis. Eh? Then uh, transfusion associated graft versus host disease. This is a severe complication, but usually if it is to happen, it can happen at any stage of transfusion where it transfuse now viable lymphocytes. Eh? As I told you, since we're transfusing packed red blood cells, the leukocyte, leukocyte count has been reduced. And um, this has been also reduced. I've been seen in, in our setup. Yeah. So always remember to check, to call back the patients who have been transfused with packed cells after at least two weeks or even a month. Eh? And you check if the condition, the hemo hemogram is still the same as when it's discharged them. So what do we do when we suspect uh, a uh, transfusion reaction? There are recommended investigations or uh, measures you're supposed to take. Uh, one, the first thing you do, you stop the transfusion. Then you would collect some samples. Huh? You would collect a sample for regrouping and cross-match from the recipient. You will collect a sample for check hemog hemogram, the full profile. Then we take another sample to check for the bilirubin level. Then we do urinalysis to check for urobilinogen. And we send back these samples with the same, the blood that was being transfused together with the giving set back to the blood transfusion unit. You will see in some hospitals, even in Kenyatta, we have a form, and that form gives you exactly how much of each sample, how much blood is needed. Eh? So 10 ml of this, 10 ml of this, 10 ml of this, a bottle of urine. So you cannot get confused and the tests that are supposed to be done. Eh? And even when that's, those samples come to the lab, they, it will be written the reason for investigation of transfusion reaction. Eh? So you're supposed to issue a report. Eh? And the thing we don't want to hear is that there is incompatibility because all the measures that go on in BTU are to exclude any possibility of A, B, or resus incompatibility. So most of the time we find that it is because of other reasons. Eh? Actually, I have not had since I started working that we have A, B, or incompatibility. It has not happened. So it is thus stringent measures that, that has been put, have been put in place to prevent that or eliminate. So both the donor and the recipient are regrouped and the compatibility, the cross-matching is repeated. Next slide, please. I've already moved on to the next slide. Yeah, yeah. So if you don't find any incompatibility, as far as A, B, or Reza's group is concerned, then they go through incubation with added enzyme. This is done so that in case there were some antibodies that could not be uh, activated at room temperature, they get activated. Huh? But now uh, it is rare, we, we mostly, do, the, most of the transfusion reactions that are reported to us are things like chills, maybe some urticaria, but I haven't seen any major transfusion reaction. We encourage you, wherever you will be, please document them uh, and make sure your hospital has a documentation. It really helps and encourage those staff working with you to know that they are doing a good job. Huh? So with that, I cannot finish. Please, next slide without talking about the policy on blood testing. Uh, this is as far as Kenya is concerned. All transfused blood in Kenya must test negative for TTIs. And the TTIs we are testing is HIV 1 and 2, syphilis, hepatitis B and C, and also all the recipient of red blood cells must be given antimalaria once they form any indication, eh? like once they develop fever, here you are justified to give an antimalaria, but we always test for it. Eh? But when, even when it is negative, we know that malaria may be present without it being present in, it may be present in the body without you getting into the thick smear. So we always give antimalarias. Eh? Now, uh, another policy that was formulated 
to help us in our transfusion practice is the handling of blood. Eh? And uh, we are adhering to this. And I believe this uh, practice has been propagated even to the periphery. Next slide. Because handling of blood is, uh, at some time it was becoming a big issue, but now there is a policy, it is a national policy, and uh, each institution where blood is uh, being transfused, they can uh, borrow from that policy. Blood can only be handled by a designated person in a designated container in, the de in, the, in a designated area. Some years ago, you used to see patients is referred to the hospital, they are put in a pickup, and relatives are uh, holding some blood, even whatever they have in, from some small centers, whatever they have in the blood transfusion unit, they, they, you will find that they have given them and they are carrying like two other units in the handbag. Eh? And that one has now stopped. Eh? That is not the way to handle blood eh? because it has to be by a designated person. It is not anybody. The designated container must contain the, uh, the appropriate additive. This is in case of the blood bag. Uh, that is the sodium citrate, pH regulator, ATP as an energy provider. And also blood can only be stored at designated temperatures. Eh? Not only designated temperatures, but also designated refrigerators. Eh? It is not where you store your milk for tea where you are going to put your blood. Eh? Fridge for blood is for blood. Blood must be used only to save a life. So if you are an athlete and you are going for a competition, you cannot come and donate you two, three units. Then when you are going in September, you come late August so that we give you back those units. That one is not acceptable. Huh? It is against blood transfusion policy in the country. Only blood tested negative for TTI can be transfused. Huh? And this one brings now questions about people who are donating for themselves. So if I'm HIV positive and I'm to undergo an operation next month, can I donate so that you give me my blood? Remember, even if I donate for myself, it has to be tested. And the only blood we transfuse, when you go to blood transfusion units, you see the unscreened blood is stored separate from the screen. So we can only issue from the screened fridge. So if you're, if you're HIV positive and it has already been put as screened and reactive, it will go through destruction, through incineration. So even when, when you're donating for yourself, you are supposed to be counseled that your blood will be given to yourself if it tests TTI negative. If it is positive, you can come back, the, the recipient can come back and sue the person who gave them blood with an infection, even if it was from themselves. So this one, if you are there to the policy, you never have that problem. Huh? So in conclusion, transfusion is an essential component of quality medical care. Blood and component cannot be obtained from a donor, so we cannot buy them from anywhere. As the disease profile changes with time, we have moved from infectious disease. Please move to the next slide. Some years ago, transfusion used to be for mainly for malaria, childbirth, accident, but now we have non-communicable diseases. Cancer is actually the one of the highest consumer, patients with cancer or some of the highest consumers of blood and accidents have increased. Those who are in urban setup, we have now border borders the cars have increased. So the demand in blood is increasing with time. Eh? And this is not matching with eh, the supply. So each hospital should have a performance monitoring and quality management program on usage of blood and blood components. Eh? It, only if we go to blood component, use of blood component, will we manage to use the little we have to save our patients eh, without wastage. Eh? The responsibility for monitoring and improving transfusion services lies in the hospital medical staff. This is all of us, eh? whether you are a nurse, whether you are a doctor, a clinician, a laboratory technologist, all of us have a role to play. Thank you.
Very great presentation, uh, Dr. Makori. Thank you so much for the evidence-based uh, use of uh, blood and blood products. I'm sure all of us have learned. And uh, at this point, I would like to introduce our panelists who will take up a lot of questions I've seen on the chat. Most of them have been answered. We have a few that have not been answered. Allow me to introduce um, as Ms. Perpetua Asuko. She is a senior lab technologist and she, she's also the head of blood transfusion unit at the Kenyatta National Hospital. Karibu Perpetua. Uh, we also, we have uh, Dr. Rajab. Dr. Rajab, um, Jamila is a senior lecturer. She's a hematology and blood transfusion uh, specialist at the University of Nairobi. Uh, she's also a consultant hematopathologist and a public health specialist. She's also a um, member of the Hemovigilance uh, Technical Working Group. Karibu Sana, uh, Daktari and Perpetua. Uh, we have a lot of questions. I don't know whether I should direct them to specifics, but uh, allow me to start from a previous question that arose uh, during our last uh, CME. I think due to lack of uh, time and also some network challenges, we were not able to answer that question um, properly. So uh, the question was, can we transfuse polycythemic uh, blood? And I think I'll give this to Dr. Rajab as uh, Dr. Makori takes uh, a breath. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Grasha Moyo. And thank you, KTTA, for putting this webinar together as part of the series of information dissemination for hemovigilance uh, within hospitals and, uh, and the country as a whole. Um, thank you, Dr. Uh, Makori, for that very informative uh, 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 presentation on the use of components. Um, and that is really what the country is advocating because you do not need to transfuse whole blood. You should only replace which component that is deficient in your patient without using whole blood because whole blood is a scarce resource and we separate it into components so that many patients can benefit from one donation. So going back to the question about uh, polycythemia, um, different countries have different policies in the use of polycythemia blood. Polycythemia has many causes, all right? Um, the, the blood, the polycythemic blood that is completely contraindicated to be used as um, uh, in recipients is the polycythemia that is due to the clonal disorder, which is called polycythemia rubravera. And that is a clonal disorder. It is a malignancy. So if a patient has polycythemia vera and you have pro uh, proved it um, in that particular patient and has that diagnosis, and there is criteria for diagnosis of polycythemia vera, then you do not lose that blood because that is a clonal disorder. But polycythemia has many causes. Polycythemia can be due to hemoconcentration. If a patient has diarrhea or is on diuretics, they can get polycythemia. And that is increased hemoglobin because of loss of plasma. So that particular blood can be used. And in some um, you know, policies in some institutions, if you can prove that the polycythemia blood that you have is not a clonal disorder, then it can be used for transfusion. In our setup here, I think because the cost of having a donor who is polycythemia and you have not proved and you need resources to prove that this patient has polycythemia rubra vera, there is the criteria for that. Um, where you even have to do um, uh, genetic um, testing, then the, the universal agreement is that if a patient is polycythemic here, then you do not use their blood because the phlebotomy that they're sent for is usually a, a therapeutic phlebotomy and you do the phlebotomy, mm -hmm. give them the normal saline, and then you, do, you discard that particular blood. Um, but in other centers, 
where you can prove that the polycythemia of that donor is not due to the clonal disorder, then it can be put into the other stocks for blood transfusion for patients. I hope that is very clear. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Rajab. That's clear. That's clear. And um, that question is now well answered. I don't think now we'll have any um, issues uh, going forward. Uh, Dr. Makori, can a father blood group AB positive and mother blood group o, o positive have a child's A negative uh, blood? And also comment on the use of HEMA cell where blood may not be available and there is reduced circulating volume, for example, after HEMA reach. Okay. Uh, you remember I showed you the inheritance of uh, the blood groups, but now um, O, A, B positive and O having a child of A. A, B and O can have a child who is a blood group A, that is true. Uh, then the Reza's factor, the way it is inherited, remember it is uh, the gene has two, just a minute. I'm going to that area, which I could put. So if you have uh, the big D and small D, you will characterize as uh, Reza's positive. Huh? So if both parents are like this, they are likely to have children who are Reza's positive and a mixture of Reza's negative as well. So it is a possibility. Right. Please go back to the, if you still have the, if you get to the presentation, go back to the inheritance and the receipt is positive. It is possible. A and O. Nelson, uh, pitch the, you could help us with our presentation. Okay. Uh, the person who has asked, they can send the, email then we send right. to them the presentation because a b okay we have both a and b antigen then o has no antigen eh? so the children are likely to be either a or b you get me uh <laughs> and, and anyway one. it Nelson. is possible to get a child with a Blood group A is as negative. Huh? Uh, that's this answered. is possible. Um, yes, thanks, Dr. Tari. So uh, um, there was a follow up uh, question on the use of HEMA cell, uh, where blood may not be available and there's reduced circulating volume. Okay. Um, HEMA cell is a colloid uh, solution. Huh? And uh, it is commonly used in acute hemorrhage. Eh? And it is good in maintaining the perfusion, eh? the tissue perfusion. But what it doesn't maintain is the oxygenation. Eh? So, have we lost you, or it's mine? Um, Dr. Moyo, I think we've lost her. We've lost her. Yes, uh, but I can take up the... Sure, sure, Dr. Yes. Rajab. I, I can, uh, yeah, I can take up uh, a response and as... Colleagues, um, are we audible? Hello? Are you able to hear me? I, Sorry. I, I wasn't hearing you, Doc. Sorry, okay, I got Dr. To Dr. McCurry is back. Okay. 
I was talking about hemacell as a colloid solution. Uh, yes. You maintain the blood pressure, but we know that it doesn't have the oxygen carrying capacity of red blood cells. Huh? So if you have a patient who has undergone a massive hemorrhage, hemacell will come in only during that short period until you get blood. Huh? So instead of, uh, trans of uh, infusing four bottles of hemacell, please put one bottle of hemacell. If you know you don't have blood, transfer the patient to the next station where they will get blood. Yeah? Okay. Yeah. Unless Dr. Yes. Rajab wants to add something else. Uh, no, no, Dr. Macquarie, I think uh, you've, you've captured it quite well. You do need um, hemoglobin for oxygen carrying capacity in patients who are actively bleeding. Um, like you said, the first concern is usually to maintain blood volume and to maintain perfusion. Um, and hemocell can do that, but it does not give you the capacity for um, oxygen carrying capacity. So you do need red cells uh, because if you don't transfuse patients, then you begin to get deoxygenation and um, uh, you, do, you, you can begin to get the complications of low oxygenation, uh, which is high lactate levels and all the complications that go up with that. So you do need red cells and hemocell is only a stopgap measure for maintaining perfusion and maintaining um, uh, blood volume and blood pressure. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rajab. Um, uh, yes. I'll proceed. Uh, Godfrey Wangila asks, how long does it take to have noticeable change of hemoglobin after transfusion? Hello, maybe I can Hello. take up that one. Um, Dr. Grasha, this is Dr. Rajab, I yes. can take up that one. Um, yes, Dr. Rajab. Okay, if you look at, uh, you know, blood transfusion guidelines, um, you know, when you're prescribing, the, the way we prescribe blood is that transfuse one unit of packed red cells uh, within four hours. So immediately you finish your transfusion, um, you're actually able uh, because the transfusion is slow, it goes after four hours, you're able to get the hemodynamics correct in your patient. And after transfusion, even within one to one to two hours, you should be able to get the incremental um, hemoglobin that you, 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 you know, that is noticeable in the patient, even after two hours of, trans of finishing the transfusion. Thank you. In the same breath, uh, Dr. Rajab, how much platelets does one get with one unit of whole blood? Likely yeah. none. Um, mm -hmm. If you're talking about whole blood, then maybe that is, uh, I mean, fresh blood. And we, that is another question. But as Mac Dr. Macquarie said, most of our, our blood is refrigerated. By the time you yes. refrigerate your blood, there is likely Lost. no, um, you know, any, any value platelets within that refrigerated blood. So you do not get any incremental platelets in your patient um, if you transfuse refrigerated whole blood. Thank you. I, it's an anonymous attendee, but I'm sure he's taken note. <laughs> uh, three questions from Joseph Sumba. Uh, mentioned something on the use of a uh, cryo supernatant. There, the question is the current policy on malaria screening. I think that one Dr. Macquarie has gone through. And then there's a comment on the use of irradiated blood products. Mm. Yes, Dr. Macquarie. Okay, uh, irradiated blood products. Uh, this is these are indicated uh, when we are dealing with patients who are immunocompromised, huh? because we know uh, we are not as much as we are doing TTI screening. There are some other microorganisms that we are not screening for, and this is a, this irradiation is supposed to take care of things like CMV and other viral agents that would be now destroyed during radiation. Huh? We are not currently doing it. I think some private hospitals are doing, but in KNH we are not doing it. But that is what we ought to be doing. More so, we have quite a number of, of our patients. Our receivers are patients who are on our chemotherapy, and that is why it is indicated, huh? plus neonates. Huh? Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Um... 
Another anonymous attendee wants to know why it is not recommended to transfuse platelets in a patient with no HB. Okay, I can answer that. The reason yes, is yes. When, uh, when you have a patient who has both low HB and low platelets, what you are trying to restore is one, to stop the bleeding, and two, to, to restore the hemostasis. Eh? Now, when you stop the bleeding, a plug has to be formed. Eh? And if you remember about your coagulation, the plug is formed by red blood cells and platelets, then the coagulation factors come in. Eh? So if the red blood cells are deficient and you are pumping in platelets, what is going to form that plug? That is actually, it is as simple as that. Eh? So you would uh, start, it is not necessary that a platelet should not be transfused when a patient is anemic, but if you have reached a certain level, even HB of uh, 8, 10, you can start now transfusing your platelets eh? and you can do it concomitantly. Like uh, you, you in the morning, you transfuse your fat cells. Well, as soon as you finish, you put your platelets. Eh? That is the reason, eh? there is no other reason. Eh? Yeah. Because the plug is formed by red blood cells and platelets and coagulation factors. Eh? Yes. So you have to finish both of them. All right. I hope I answered that question. Um, this is Dr. Rajab with, the, well, uh, with permission through the chair, Dr. Yes. Grasha through the moderator. Please go ahead, Dr. Rajab. Yeah, I just wanted to add something on the use of irradiated blood by the question by Dr. Joseph Sumba. Um, the other value for irradiated blood is that you try and deactivate or, re, um, shall I say in quotes, kill viable lymphocytes that would cause graft versus host disease in the immunocompromised patients. So, in patients for oncology, patients who are for, let's say, bone marrow transplant, renal transplant patients, or even in hemodialysis, you know, you would use irradiated blood because the idea is to reduce the, the you know, the lymphocytes within that particular component that you're using to reduce graft versus host disease. And in, again, in reduction of, uh, you know, um, uh, viral um, markers or viral um, organisms, then you can use irradiated blood in the immunocompromised set, uh, setting. Um, the current practice is to use what is called leukoreduced blood. And if you look at other blood banks all over the world that, you know, um, because there's a cost to it, because you have to buy that filter, all blood, donated blood is leukoreduced. And the idea is to reduce as to remove as many white cells as possible, probably all white cells because they're not of any value. So current practice and even in some of the hospitals in our setting is that they look or reduce all their blood, remove all the white cells, um, and then that reduces the risk of graft versus host disease in the immunocompromised patient or reduce the risk of disease marker transmission. Great, that question I uh, think answers Susan's question. Uh, thank you for the presentation for patients receiving uh, repeated uh, transfusions. Is CMV negative? Uh, where has it gone? Is CMV negative blood available or leukoreduced blood? If not, is there a move towards availing this to reduce the risk of transmission? Dr. Rajab has answered that question. The next one is from an non anonymous attendee. Thank you for the presentation. Is giving antimalarials after RBC transfusion in any guideline so that we can quote it in the words? Wouldn't that lead to resistance to antimalarials and which antimalarial is recommended? I think we'd get this from uh, Dr. Macquarie, who is in the words. Oh, Dr. Rajabi, we've lost Sorry. Dr. Macquarie. No, no, I'm back. Huh? The current guidelines for use of antimalaria does not uh, consider use of antimalaria for prophylaxis. Huh? Right. So we cannot do what we used to do. Or oh, well, whenever you get blood, you get uh, some antimalaria. So now mm. we 
we only use the current anti-malaria when you have uh, proven that the patient has malaria. So, so now um, in that case, you select depending on the condition of the patient, whether oral or injectable. Yes. Yeah. That's answered. Uh, Nelly is asking regarding the TTIs, where does COVID-19 fall? Is it transmission transmissible? <laughs> There is, no, there is no evidence of a uh, transmission uh, transmitted COVID-19. Well, um, at least uh, there's no new guidelines uh, on uh, adding it uh, in the TTI uh, so that it can be screened. Uh. So yes. as far as you are concerned, COVID-19 is taken care in our questionnaire. So we get donors who are healthy, and uh, we are waiting for new recommendations. Huh? WHO has not issued any recommendation towards that. And this is Maybe anybody has something, yeah? something okay. new about this, we can learn as well. Dr. Rajab, you have something to say? Uh, sorry, Dr. Mohoyo, I think I missed that. COVID-19 as part of the TTIs. No, no, no. I think uh, Dr. Jermaine has handled that very well. There is no evidence that uh, um, COVID-19 is transfusion transmissible. And there's no new guidelines um, for, for testing, for pre-transfusion testing of COVID-19 in donor blood. And from the WHO or the CCC or CDC, yeah. Thank you. I know we'll also have uh, another presentation on the... TTI testing, uh, but uh, there is an, an anonymous attendee wants to a comment on blood donation during the window period. Mm -hmm. uh, do we do PCR? Dr. McCrory. Okay, uh, what we are doing, we are doing antibody screening and um, the PCR is available. But uh, as we understand now, we, uh, we don't pass all the donor blood through the PCR. No? But whenever people, whenever we get a screened positive, they have to go now through the PCR. Thank you. So Halima is, also, is asking whether we still administer antimalarials before transfusion. That one has been answered. The answer is no. Uh, what about... Uh, Auto transfusion where a patient is, is bled before start of surgery and they are transfused back at the end of surgery. Any comments from any of our panelists? And what is the question there? What about auto transfusion? There must mm -hmm. mean uh, where a patient is bled before start of surgery and then mm -hmm. transfused back at the end of the surgery. After that one is currently encouraged. Um, and uh, the patient has to understand that the blood will have to go through screening for TTIs. Eh? I think I talked about that. Eh? Yes. yes. Yeah. Uh, the other question is, how do you calculate how much platelets and how much FFPs to transfuse? Platelets are 10 ml per kg, and the FFPs, I said 15, 15 ml or so per kg, then you monitor, that is the loading dose, then you continue with 10 ml as maintenance. But you understand before you give FFP, you are correcting something. Eh? So whatever you should decide on transfusing FFP, you should continue monitoring because at some time you have to stop. Eh? Once the condition, once the the values have normalized yeah, on the coagulation profile. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Tony is asking, how soon can we repeat hemoglobin to check for ice after transfusion? I'm leaving. You can check that. for. Uh... Sorry. Yes, Dr. McCurry. Well, you can check after 24 hours. Huh? 
but also you have to monitor the clinical condition of the patient. Eh? So if the patient is still bleeding, you can uh, you transfuse, but you continue transfusing eh? as you check now for the hemoglobin. Let's say the HB is three and somebody came in bleeding. Eh? So you understand that one unit is not going to bring it to 10. Eh? So as you calculate sure. now how, how many units the patient will need, you request for those, then uh, you start your transfusion. Eh? You won't be stopping yeah. and wait for the results to come from the lab, and you can clearly see that the patient is pain huh? still. Thank you. Thank you. Is Papecho yeah. in the call? Papecho, are you in the call? Papecho? She was there. She was there. Okay, fine, we'll just proceed. Perpetua, when you're in, kindly uh, jump into any of the questions. Uh, comment on future research on alternatives to donation, blood transfusion, stem cells. Towards up. Well, there is a, a lot of research that is going on of, on alternatives for blood transfusion. There is a different um, molecules that are being um, um, explored in terms of uh, HB carrying H, uh, you know, HB carrying capacity um, and even platelet um, molecules that may have a role in hemostasis. So a lot of research is going on um, for the availability of stem cells. Um, we are still looking at stem cells in terms of uh, stem cell transplant. Uh, but as for alternatives for blood transfusion or raising um, or having a, a stem cell for red cell production, um, that is uh, you know, uh, still a way, a way, a long way to go. Right now, what is being looked at is mainly, um, you know, how can we have molecules that are not, um, you know, um, are not do not have large side effects in terms of uh, oxygen carrying capacity. Looking at molecules that have hemoglobin-like properties in terms of oxygen carrying capacity. So that's what's being looked at right now. Um, and they're looking at various, uh, you know, disrupted red cell stromas and, uh, but, you know, uh, use of stem cells and um, not yet um, adopted. Right. I don't know whether Dr. Makori has any other comment on that, the use of stem uh, cells. Not, no, not about the stem cells. Thank you for the for the answer. There is a clinical uh, question here. It looks like a case study. Kindly comment on the need for transfusion in these two groups: mm -hmm. surgery, um, chronic anemic patient comes for hysterectomy with a HB of seven grams per deciliter. Mm -hmm. Number two, it's still pregnancy. Similarly, a third trimester mother with HB of seven grams per deciliter comment on the need for transfusion in these two groups. Must okay. be a clinician who wants to know how to manage <laughs> these two patients. Uh, the mother in third trimester with HPO7, third trimester, is it means that the delivery is imminent. And uh, whether normal delivery or cesarean section, bleeding is anticipated. Eh? So that one, yeah. you have to correct that HB because you anticipate bleeding. Eh? Now, yes. the other one, chronic anemic patient with uh, hysterectomy. With she has something. I, I think there was another Thanks condition. For a hysterectomy. Hysterectomy, probably due to uterine fibroids. Huh? Yeah. So if the HB is seven, and this is a, a patient has been anemic for some time, probably iron deficiency. I would go for iron supplementation. Huh? Mm -hmm. then give her time for the HP to reach 10. Eh? Because it is, the condition has been there. You know, blood transfusion also has its own complications. And if you can avoid it, you avoid it. Eh? 
So even if the patient waits for a few weeks to surgery as you do iron supplementation, that would be better for her. Yeah. To avoid her getting a transfusion. Thanks, Dr. Makori. Uh, Esther is asking why should athletes not donate blood? I... Any comment on that? I've not seen it in the contraindications anywhere, even in the WHO, but maybe we can have a comment from any of our panelists. And I've not seen it as a contraindication. I've not seen it. Maybe though, you know, most of them are uh, our athletes, especially like the, the, the ones we have in Kenya, most of them, the weight is quite low. But uh, now reason for other reason for them not to donate blood, I've not come across it. Mm. Um, maybe comment also, I have not seen uh, that, that being an athlete is a contraindication to being a donor. Um, Dr. Makori has commented on especially the long distance runners tend to be very mm. slight in weight, so they may not, um, you know, uh, fit the criteria of the minimum uh, weight for um, blood transfusion in Kenya for donors, blood, or rather blood donation for, for donors. Um, those are the ones yeah. who are very low in weight. Um, but there is actually no contraindication that athletes um, should not donate blood. Um, athletes mainly work uh, in terms of having optimum hemoglobin levels. So I, I guess if they are due for a competition, then they should not donate because um, one of the fitness measures is actually to have uh, a, 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 your, your, your maximum level hemoglobin for obvious reasons for muscle um, uh, performance and yeah. energy, uh, you know, but I think that's all I would say. I mean, athletes are healthy people. If they do meet the criteria for donors in Kenya, they should donate, unless of course it's going to interfere with uh, a, a competition um, that may be close to the time of donation. Okay. Thanks, Dr. Raja, for that addition. Um, I think uh, for the panelists, if you can type on any of the questions uh, as we run through the, the Q&A session, since we are running out of time, uh, just uh, sampling the questions, please comment on the issue of cross-matching blood preoperatively, just in case it may be needed. Is it a waste of resources when it is not collected? No, and it I is not. That uh, indeed wants to... uh, no, it is not because yeah we can hear you okay it is not a waste of resources because it helps us save that patient eh? as much as that blood may not mm -hmm. be used now imagine if you need you are in theater and uh, you cut through a major vessel and the bleeding starts and you have now to request for an cross-matched blood that the patient may later react to and that could have been avoided by you submitting a sample from that patient, so that blood is waiting for them. Huh? Once it is there and the, the theater right. list has been completed and is not used, it goes back to the pool. Huh? So there are always patients who need blood. Huh? So please don't feel discouraged yeah. to do it. Huh? Yeah. Can I, uh, doctor, I, I can I answer that's... another question here I've seen? Somebody is sure. asking, sure. after a transfusion reaction, how soon can you transfuse the patient? Huh? As I said, you mm -hmm. stop the transfusion, you take your samples uh, to the lab yes. and you continue observing the patient. Once the patient has stabilized, because yeah. once you return the unit to the lab, they will do another cross-matching with another, another unit. Eh? So another one will be delivered within like two, three mm -hmm. hours. Eh? So you can continue. Remember the indications are yes. still there. I hope I've answered that mm -hmm. person. Yeah. For how long should the blood be transfused, especially in children where we give a few mLs? Is it okay to give it uh, via a syringe? <laughs> Interesting. Mm -hmm. Dr. Moyo, what was the question there? 
Hello. How long Am I audible? should blood be transfused? Yeah. Yes, you are. I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, I can. We can, can hear you, hear you Dr. Moyo. Yes, we can. For how long should blood be transfused, especially in children where we give a few mLs? And is it okay to give it via a syringe? <laughs> Uh, okay, well, I guess, um, you know, this, this is practice of where there's no resources uh, for blood transfusion for pediatrics, the guidelines are very clearly there, even within the pediatric guidelines from the Ministry of Health. So I would um, encourage the person who is asking the question um, to look at the guidelines in the pediatric guidelines um, treatment guidelines. Um, pediatric blood is usually transfused at a, maybe uh, the total transfusion is usually um, uh, 10 mils per kg and there's a way, there's a formula that you calculate the deficit depending on the correction that you want to get in that for that pediatric patient and you transfuse um, the, the, it within four hours, slowly over four hours. Uh, the guidelines are there in the way you transfuse and the monitoring that the nurses need to do for that particular child. So um, the question is very vague in terms of how long do you transfuse the, the, the blood, I don't understand, because you'll calculate the volume that you want, and pediatrics have yeah, guidelines yeah. in the way you calculate that particular volume, and you transfuse it over four hours under the same conditions with the same monitoring from the nursing staff. Um, in terms of using a, a syringe, there is, a, you know, um, uh, what we call pediatric packs or pedi packs that can put you, you that uh, holds a small volume for very small babies and medium sized babies and large babies. Um, uh, pedi packs may not be available everywhere in the setting within the transfusion and within the practice in Kenya. Um, I know I have seen some people try to use solucets, um, uh, but the use of syringes is not, um, you know, is, I, I, is not encouraged. Um, the only time that I've seen syringes being used, the big syringes, is when you're doing an exchange um, transfusion. You need to exchange transfusion, yes. Okay. So the one who is asking the questions, kindly um, refer to the pediatric treatment guidelines for various conditions that is available from the Ministry of Health uh, and even in the appropriate use of blood and blood uh, uh, components, which is a, a, a publication of KTTA. Sure. It has a section on neonatal and pediatric transfusion. Uh, running uh, short of time, but allow me just to take uh, maybe three questions. Comment on why medical personnel are not allowed to donate blood despite <laughs> the shortage of blood donors. <laughs> That's from Alan I call. Unless from your side, uh, kindly, uh, Dr. Makori or Dr. Rajab. <laughs> I didn't know we were not supposed to donate blood. Now you know. <laughs> okay, <laughs> the, the major reason is uh, during that in the questionnaire, they ask you if you have been in contact with patients. Huh? And we are constantly in contact with patients, not only in contact with patients, but also we are doing procedures. Eh? You don't know when you get infected, when you get exposed to some infection that could be incubating at any given time. Eh? So that is one of the reasons. And I believe also it was put there to deter people who want to keep on donating like every month. Eh? It can put undue pressure Let's say a mother comes, she's bleeding and there you are the surgeon there and there's nobody else. Imagine how many times it can happen to you and you're expected to keep on donating like every three or four months. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So oh, if nice. you get an infection, it is difficult now until now it is overt and it is tested. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank okay. you for that. Alan also Maybe wants Dr. to know that has many... another reason. Okay. Dr. Rajab. <laughs> no other reason. Um, 
well, medical actively um, practicing medical personnel are considered high risk for the reasons that Dr. McCurry has said, especially surgeons, um, obstetricians, uh, pediatrics who are exposed to patients, and uh, you know, the high risk in terms of they could be, um, you know. Remember, somebody talked about a window period. Even if we do take the donations and they're negative for the disease markers, there's, they, then they become high risk in terms of could they be in the window period because of the exposure that uh, yeah. you know they they, they 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 are at risk of. So they are considered as in quotes high risk donors. Uh, but sometimes when you know if, if push comes to shove, then. Um, you know, some medical personnel that are in low risk areas uh, can actually donate maybe radiologists or, you know, what is considered as, as a low risk medical practitioners. So, um, and in, 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 in some institutions when, you know, if, uh, uh, a medical practitioner may actually, you know, uh, be in a position where they would act as a donor for somebody, but they are considered as high risk donors, yes. Um, yeah. Second, last, uh, what's the recommended product transfusion ratio in acute hemorrhage? Online, we see the best protocol of one into one into one. And uh, the recommended uh, product transfusion ratio. We use the same, and I think there would be a presentation on massive transfusion. Huh? Okay. I think, I think it is one of the planned uh, presentations. Huh? Mm -hmm. yeah. It will, yeah, it will come together with the quality management. We'll we'll put in a uh, part. Maybe you can it's invite this person. Us on. Yes, yeah. the questions yeah. are many. Uh, many. Uh, someone is asking whether you can give more than two uh, whole units in twenty four hours, especially if the patient is not actively bleeding. I think that should be our last question. Uh, why more than two units and why whole blood? We don't use whole blood, we use packed cells. So if we are correcting an anemia and the patient is not bleeding, remember you are giving from two different donors. Eh? So if the patient mm -hmm. is not or impending CCF, you are better off giving one unit today and continue with another one tomorrow so that you observe that patient. Eh? Mm. Plus, how the risk of security overload. I don't know. We have to consider the condition of the patient as you start those transfusion. Huh? Mm. But there would be a lot you would have to consider, not just the hemoglobin. Yeah. How cardiac function, any comorbidities, such. Huh? And also, please, yes. or not. Huh? Mm. Uh, there was a question uh, that Dr. Rajab handled. Uh, the question on athletes uh, donating blood there is uh, an addition. The correction is, I think the question on athletes is they donate for themselves, then they get retransfused just before a competition. Douglas has clarified. But uh, I think I talked Excuse about me. that. Excuse me. Yes. We have a representative from the Athletics Kenya who has oh, a few okay. We've had on our panel who she, she can comment on uh, on the athlete's donation. Her name is Dr. Carol Yes, yes, this is Nelson. Also pitch the, the presentation and uh, put up the conclusion slide. Someone really wants to see it as, uh, as we get that presentation from the athlete Kenya. Thank you. Please go ahead. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you for this really great presentation and thank you for giving me the opportunity to, to contribute to that. So <clears throat> um, thank you, Dr. Rajab. So one of the issues that we look at, and so I'm, I'm Dr. Carol Okot, sorry, I didn't introduce myself. We were, um, myself and I, colleagues from the National Olympic Committee and that week's Kenya had done the series on anti-doping. And uh, we had mentioned the role of medical personnel in helping us in fighting this uh, doping 
uh, menans. So one of the areas that is tackled is blood doping. And basically what would happen is an athlete, um, you know, donating their blood, but the intention is to retransfuse uh, that blood is an autologous uh, transfusion with the aim of performance enhancement, and that is a doping offense. And uh, unfortunately, anyone who participates in that as a medical personnel and an athlete who can be sanctioned for the athlete, it means uh, withdrawing them from the sport and the medical personnel, you can actually be fined or jailed as uh, per the current laws. So anytime <clears throat> we are managing athletes, it's important for them to declare that they are athletes so that any time a transfusion is uh, conducted, it is for an appropriate indication. And those medical records are well kept so that uh, in case the uh, anti-doping officials would like access to them, it is clarified that it was for a justified reason. Um, yeah, so that's my contribution to that. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Caro. Uh, and thank you so much, uh, um, Nelson, for pitching this uh, conclusion uh, uh, slide. Um, I think the other question that uh, was very dominant was about CPD points. I don't know whether you have something to say, uh, Nelson, about CPD points. Everybody seems not to be getting their CPD points. Any word on it? Nelson or any NH uh, representative? Yes, this is Nelson. Yes, um, for yes, the CPD points, we've been having a bit of challenges, with, especially with the KMPD portal. Um, uh, they are undergoing uh, maintenance or rather an upgrade, and we've been facing challenges uh, generating the tokens, but we are working on that with them. So as soon as uh, the system has been upgraded, we'll start sending out the points again. For PPB, there was a slight delay, but we have uploaded all of the sessions on the PPB portal. So if you have, uh, if you participated in uh, the past sessions for this year, we'd encourage you to kindly go and subscribe so that we can send you your tokens. The NCK as well, um, uh, there has been uh, a delay on their end in terms of the, the portal has been down. So we've been working with them to get the codes for the previous sessions. And once the, we, we manage to get them, we'll also send, the, send out the points. For COC, um, the, we normally maintain the attendance uh, registers and we send them to the COC, uh, to, to your council, and they will uh, upload uh, the, the attendance list on their end and uh, award the tokens using that attendance list. But if you have um, any further query, kindly email us at knhcpd at gmail.com so that we can be able to assist you further. Thanks, Nelson, that's clear. Uh, allow me to give uh, uh, maybe 30 seconds each to uh, our panelists and our speaker, just to give their closing remarks. Dr. McCrory. Dr. Rajab. Um, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Moyo and the KTTA team for putting these um, uh, webinars together on blood transfusion, which is a, nat a national resource. Um, we, uh, from the number of questions, we can see almost numbering 90. There is uh, lots of need for these um, forums to exchange the experiences that we have across the country in terms of blood transfusion. and. Uh, um, sharing um, expertise in, um, in in best practice. Um, and I say that um, going through the questions, I can see questions that have not been answered. Um, if these are made available, we can be able to respond to them. Um, and um, KTTA can see a way to disseminate them to the members that have, um, have, have, have attended today's forum. Um, for, for blood transfusion, component therapy is the way to go. Remember, blood is a scarce resource. We rarely meet our national needs and judicious use by use of components are correcting the component that is deficient and not using whole blood is the way to go because one unit can benefit many. And being aware of 
um, the value of the components and how to use them to get maximum use from the components is very important um, uh, for, for patient care and to achieve best outcomes for our patients. I think that's uh, my comments, Dr. Moyo. Thank you so much, Dr. Rajab, for that uh, comprehensive conclusion. In fact, I had the same prayer to Nelson. If we can have this, the questions available, we could uh, have a uh, getaway of disseminating them to the attendees because uh, time didn't allow us to go through all the questions. Dr. Makori, you left. Is Perpetua in? I don't want to no, take I haven't your... left. I'm still there. I'll kindly so... give your closing remarks. Thank you for uh, inviting us. and. Uh... Oh, the, what I could uh, recommend to those who are in attendance it is to advocate for component availability in, this, in the units or wherever they work. And also remember that blood is only used to save a life. Huh? So let's not land into problems. As our indications increase for use of blood and blood products, so are the recreational uses, eh? like now doping as we have just had. Eh? There must be other many more that we may not know about. So don't get coerced into administering blood transfusion eh? for the wrong reasons. Yeah. Thank you for attending. Sure. Papecho? I, I can't see her, but just allow me also to give my closing remarks. I uh, think we've, uh, we've had it from from the experts. Uh, the, the decision to transfuse uh, should be really careful. It's a careful consideration of the expected benefits uh, versus the potential risks. And uh, we are moving out of whole blood. Uh, component transfusion is the way to go. Thank you so much for attending. When we get reactions uh, to the patients, let's report them. We need data to show uh, our patterns, uh, our kind of reactions, and therefore, therefore corrective action. They're not in, in any way punitive. Uh, when we go to the pharmacy board uh, website, there is a form there for advanced transfusion uh, reactions. Uh, or you could actually just uh, take a photo of that uh, transfusion reaction form and just send it to us at uh, hemovigilance reports at kttta.go.ke. Uh, .ke. When you go to the KTTA website, we have all those policy and guidelines. We have uh, the use, the rational use of blood and blood products. We have a lot of resources. Kindly get in there and uh, find the resources uh, to inform us. Um, we have uh, other sessions, and of course, the kind of questions will inform what other sessions we are going to have uh, going forward. And thank you so much for your patience and for attending this forum. Thank you so much, uh, Nelson, for organizing for us this and our panelists and our speaker. Thank you so much. I uh, think we can end it there for today. Santi.